Welcome one and all to the Ferret and Raccoon podcast episode 184. I am your one and only host for this podcast, The Angry Raccoon, bringing you the last podcast of January 2022. And it has been quite the interesting week for me personally. I'm sure a ton of unfortunate and somewhat quite eventful things have happened over the last uh, two weeks or since the previous podcast. I'm not going to dwell too much into them because they kind of fall into politics and that's not really what this podcast is about. It's more about media and just, well, you guys know what this podcast is about. You know what to expect. You've seen the thumbnail, you've seen the title, and hopefully you're returning from previous podcasts, which I thank you. But yeah, in terms of things that I have been doing more accurately not doing or avoiding to some extent is I have come into contact with so many people who have been sick over the last two weeks. I am surprised that I'm not ill myself. Granted, I do have a sore throat, but I have done a test and I'm negative as of right now. But at the same time, yeah, I have dodged illness and sickness and obviously the big C a lot these past few days. So I am truly grateful for my health and the fact that uh, I'm actually feeling pretty good right now. Other things I've been doing over the last uh, few days, I've been really listening to a lot of like old school rap and hip hop, specifically more from the 90s era. I don't know why, I've just I've just been on that feeling or that vibe for whatever reason. I've been listening to a lot of stuff from, also kind of in 2000s as well, been listening to a lot of like Slum Village, uh, Black Sheep, uh, Queen Latifah, I completely forgot that she was a fantastic rapper. Um, uh, some Black Moon, some Big Daddy Kane, some a little bit of Tupac, a little bit of Notorious B.I.G., and some other tracks which I'm loving and, you know, really enjoying as of right now. But yeah, that's one of the things I've just kind of been keeping me sane over the last few days, I guess, given what I've previously just mentioned. But the one thing I did watch was something that I did talk about on the previous podcast, and that is The House, 2022's House, which is on Netflix right now. Um, this was a animated or stop motion animated anthology series. I, not series, well, it's a, technically a series of stories, but I, on the previous podcast, called it a series. It's actually a film. And it's about an hour and 35 minutes, but I absolutely adored it. I thought it was fantastic, and I would highly recommend watching it. It is interesting where the stories go and how they kind of connect with the house itself to some extent which i'm not going to spoil but i really did like how each story kind of had a different approach in terms of how it told said narrative like the best example i can give to you as to what this show is it's basically three really good but classic feeling like ghost stories to some extent done in beautiful stop motion animation that does have a lot of fun with the i guess art form of stop motion animation The first story itself kind of follows a family who are essentially given a massive house to live in and that causes some issues. The second story follows a rat character who is essentially doing up a house in order to sell it off and a couple are very interested in the property. And the third story follows a cat who is trying to make the house she lives in just perfect but she feels like she's not really getting anywhere with it. So, very simple, obviously I'm not going into great detail, because I do not want to spoil it, and I would love for everyone to go watch it. When I talk about Netflix actually doing good things and supporting them on that, this is one of those things. Please go watch this, because if they see that this show actually does good numbers, they will seek out the license to other shows like this. You know, Netflix do stupid things, but they're not stupid to some extent. If a trend is popular, they will jump on it, even if that means we get good stuff like this. I do believe that Netflix themselves did partly license this and fund it, although I believe the BBC also had some hand in making it a thing. So I would highly recommend watching it. I just want to commemorate everyone who worked on that series because I keep saying series, film, because it is fantastic. But yeah, moving on to some things that happened over the last two weeks, I did actually notice, staying on the topic of stop motion, that... 2022 does seem to be the year of stop motion animation to some extent, uh, mainly because we're going to be talking about well, one trailer that kind of re-reminded me and kind of led me down a little bit of a rabbit hole was the fact that uh, Netflix themselves finally dropped the trailer for Guillermo del Toro's uh, Pinocchio, which is a film that has been in production or are kind of in the works or planned 
Well, Guillermo del Toro has been trying to make this film, I think, since about 2008 or 2006. And I wouldn't say it's been in production nightmare, but I think it's been more of those cases where nobody really wanted to pick it up. And I guess Netflix kind of came in, gave him or whoever a little bit more money to actually get this film done in order to have it be on Netflix. And yeah, we got a small, very small teaser trailer, which just has uh, Cricket, who is voiced by Ewan McGregor, essentially talking about, you know, the story we're hopefully going to be seeing in the film. Uh, pretty simple trailer, and already I'm excited for this film, because Ewan McGregor has a lovely voice. Um, although the Cricket himself has a simple design, I do love his design. There's, there's something about it that's, I don't know, it shifted in a somewhat cartoonish and characteristic way, but also a realistic, I guess, way in which our cricket looks to some extent. You know, without it being, you know, too far this way, too far that way, which I think is really cool. And the animation is smooth as hell because this piece of animation is not going to be in the film. Maybe. I don't know. It looks like it was an original piece done to tease the film, but already just smooth as hell. And it is also worth noting that Mark Gustafsson, Gustafsson, uh, I'm not quite sure how you say his name. I'll give you the spelling of his second name, which is G-U-S-T-A-F-S-O-N. He was the animation director for Wes Anderson's Fantastic Mr. Fox, and he is also serving as the, I think, co-director, director? Director, excuse me, uh, on this film. So we are in safe hands, which is great. But a few things I really liked about this trailer, or I guess this film, is the potential concept that Cricket could literally be living in inside Pinocchio's heart, which is very interesting, because you could have, like, these, well, of course, I'd imagine what's going to happen is he's going to be acting as his consciousness to some extent, but maybe there'll be themes around, like, two being existings as one, so existentialism, existentialism, which would be really cool, and I would love to see, like, a wooden internal anatomy of Pinocchio, like, he has, like, lungs, or, like, a brain to some extent or you know some way in which his his body or the insides of his body kind of works to some extent i think that would be really fascinating but kind of creepy at the same time which you know is to be expected from gilmore del Toro. he likes things in that kind of shifted sense in a way but watching this teaser trailer and kind of thinking about that and also thinking about the house which came out um, just a couple of days ago, and then also back in last year, um, Netflix released uh, Robin Robin, you know, just at the tail end of uh, 2021 and Christmas, which was an Ardman animation, it was like a Christmas special, I think it was about 30 minutes long, I haven't seen it yet, unfortunately, uh, we've also got Henry Selick's uh, Wedel, Wendell and Wild. This is a film that has been in production for a while again. Um, Henry Sillick, he's the guy who directed James and the Giant Peach. He also did animation and directed, uh, um, why am I forgetting the name? Um, uh, Nightmare on Christmas. And what else did he do? He did something else as well. Oh, Coraline. So the guy knows his stuff and I can't wait for that film. Uh, and also at the same time as well, that literally released right after the Pinocchio trailer was the fact that Ardman and Netflix, I guess, are going to be partnering up to do another Wallace and Gromit project. It has no title. We don't know if it's going to be short. I think it's going to be some kind of film, but we see we don't know that much information. And also they have, I guess, acquired probably the rights for the Chicken Run sequel, which is going to be titled Dawn of the Nugget. So... It is really interesting to, to, to have all this stop motion animation in, um, information and all these things to look forward to, especially given that I'm sure any Hollywood studio executive would tell you that stop motion does not work and it's not profitable and everyone hates it and it will fail. But it is interesting. I mean, Wallace and Gromit, I can't wait to see this project. I mean, I grew up on those shorts. In my opinion, The Wrong Trousers is perfect. I think that is perfect in every single way. Um, the original Trick and Run came out 22 years ago and honestly I'm not the biggest fan of that film I really should be but I'm not there's something about that film that has always bothered me even from a young age maybe it's because I have al I had already seen The Great Escape before I saw that film because it's basically The Great Escape but the sequel sounds like fun I hope that it's going to be good I hope I hope they stay true to the original ideas and themes of the first film and they hopefully they don't get too 
modern and preachy about it to some extent. Obviously, when we're talking about, you know, chickens, obviously we're talking about farming. We're obviously talking about uh, the environment and all the other things that affect that, the ripple effect that happens when you talk about that. And then there's vegetarianism and all that crazy stuff. I hope that the film stays clear of that to some extent. I'm not saying you can't make jokes or references to that. What I'm saying is I hope that the film isn't just trying to make a point about that and it loses focus or it loses the whole point of, you know, making entertainment, making something that people can enjoy that still has some kind of message because that's doable. You can do it. But yeah, it is interesting to see Netflix going hard with stop motion animation uh, this year and I guess maybe in the future. Fingers crossed. And I'm all for it. Um, this is what they should be doing. They should be funding, releasing, and acquiring the license to these smaller original media projects, even if they are stop-motion animations. Because here's the thing, I'll watch it, and every other person who loves animation will watch it, and children will watch it. There's a market there. I mean, if anime sells, stop-motion will sell. Maybe not as much, but it still has an audience. People are craving it, and it's just really cool to see. Another quick note as well is... Still talking about stop motion, we have Luckier, who is the film studio that put out Coraline and Paranorman and Kubo and the Two Strings and a couple other few films as well. Uh, the Missing Link as well, which came out a few years ago. Their next film comes out next year and it would have been perfect if it came out this year because then I could truly say that 2022 was the year of stop motion, but it still might. I mean, The House is pretty good. So far, it's my favorite film of the year, so... I don't know, let's see what happens, but let's talk about another pretty eventful and interesting thing that happened over the last two weeks, which is more in line with gaming and I guess any implications that ha that has, and that is the fact that Microsoft will be acquiring Activision Blizzard for roughly about, I believe it's $70 billion, which is making it the biggest acquisition within the video game industry of all time, which is a big deal because I did not see that coming it was pretty unexpected and i have some really conflicting feelings about this to some extent there's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad mostly bad to some extent but it is just very random but at the same time it's not that surprising given microsoft just wants to acquire every single studio to some extent and i mean let's look at both sides on one hand, Microsoft can and should remove all the toxic people still in the Blizzard Activision company. I mean, they have to. They're going to buy a company linked to assault and harassment. It's what they need to do, you know, and they're going to have to start rebuilding their reputation uh, to some extent because no one wants anything to do with Activision Blizzard right now, which still is super questionable as to why they even acquired them. Like... Part of me thinks that this was, you know, whoever is responsible for the toxicness or toxic toxicity in that company was probably just trying to use this as some kind of scapegoat to some extent. You know, they'd be um, absolved of all of their crimes by doing this. Oh, it, it's Microsoft's problem now, but I don't know. I mean, they could start fresh. You know, they could start by listening to fans, something Activision didn't do for the most part. Um, they could revive old franchises in order to like win back fans, particularly of those franchises, because it is a bit problematic when you're a big fan of a franchise that Activision owns and you want to play that game and it's just like, oh, but Activision. But yeah, um, I don't know anything about StarCraft, for example, but I want a new StarCraft game. Um, so that the fans can be happy and so that they get something they want and variety is always good. Video gaming is getting a little bit generic to some extent, mainly from one, you know, company, but we'll get to them in a sec. Um, so there is that aspect that they could actually revive franchises, and I'm going to link a, um article or, I think, interview in the description and download link where they talk about what their plans are for said franchises that they've acquired. Already they've mentioned a few obscure ones, and obviously my main concern, because at the end of the day, with Activision... I only really want Crash Bandicoot and Spyro the Dragon. That's all I really care about them. They've got nothing I care about, to be honest. And anything that I would care about, they've pretty much destroyed to some extent. So, yeah, I would love to see that happen. But on the other hand, we've got to look at the bad. 
this is very hip, this is a very hypocritical move on Microsoft's part, given how many original franchises they already have and have done absolutely nothing with. Like, look up how many franchises they have on the original Xbox alone. It's shocking, because they could easily bring back some of these for like little to no money. You know, make them download exclusives for now, charge £10 for them, they will make their money back, and then over time when that game, or if it does pick up popularity, you know, you do a physical release for the people who really loved it. it, it it's it's shocking. They really should bring some of these franchises back. I didn't have enough time to go through all of them because there is a lot, but they just need to bring them back or just do something with them. I mean, I'm not talking about making them accessible to play because that's already a thing. Microsoft has made a very good and hard point about you know, being able to play older games. So you can play them, but I'm talking more about sequels because there's some that, you know, have the right to have a sequel or, you know, I, I take a remake to some extent, even just some acknowledgement for that matter. And, you know, I mean, they have all these studios and all these franchises, yet they mo and they most likely won't do anything with them. You know, like they have this mass collection and they're just sitting on it. You know, it's a, it's a little bit frustrating to some extent. I'm not saying everything needs to come back and not everything will work if it comes back. But here's the thing. I mean, does anyone remember what happened with Rare? Rare Studios, they used to make Nintendo games for the 64. They got bought by Microsoft. They made Grab by the Ghoulies, um, uh, Kano, Kano. I can't remember what that name was. And then they were just set to make, like, connect party games for about a decade. And then they came back with Sea of Thieves and they got another game, and it's just like, ugh, my god. It, it's unfortunate, because I can easily see them releasing Spyro 4. It sells, like, you know, 8 to 10 million copies, and them saying, oh, people just aren't interested in the franchise, I guess you won't do another one, because that's how these companies work. And on another quick note as well, when I was reading the article about them acquiring and all the positivity um, they're going to do with like acquiring such a big studio they really lost me when they mentioned the metaverse like I'm surprised it's a thing people are still pushing like no one wants this the only people that want this are just greedy corporations like Microsoft themselves which is really unfortunate but at the same time this whole situation which I believe isn't going to happen until next year I, I, um, Microsoft won't fully own Activision until uh, 2023, so let's say if there is a new Crash game or a Spyro game, I hope it comes out this year so that at least we get one more game before Xbox or Microsoft decides they never want to touch that franchise ever again because it didn't make 50 billion copies, or sell 50 billion copies to that matter. And yeah, it's a big deal because it puts a lot of pressure on Sony, who, sure, have the more iconic and culturally significant you know, characters and franchise, or at least more of them compared to Microsoft. But the actual line of like franchises and originals or exclusives is looking really small now compared to Microsoft acquiring Activision, who has like, you know, a lot <laughs> to some extent. Sony needs to step up at this rate in a lot of areas, but I'm mainly talking about games because Naughty Dog isn't going to save them. Naughty Dog can't produce a game fast enough to really sell, you know, PlayStation 5s, unfortunately. And no one can really get a PlayStation 5. It's becoming a bit of a joke now. Like, most people are going to buy the Series X because they can get it. You know, people are very impatient at the end of the day. And I can kind of see in the future a battle between, like, Sony and Microsoft to some extent. With Sony they're going to be the more AAA cinematic experiences that only appeal to the West, whereas Microsoft are going to be the more varied and more uh, variety-based console with games of different like visual styles and gameplay. And it should be interesting to see who people are going to pick because I don't think the hype behind the PlayStation 5 is that big. There isn't really that many games on it. Like, trust me, if a PlayStation 5 right now was £100, I wouldn't buy it because I'd only play Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart and that's it, you know, it's, I mean, granted, to be fair, the PlayStation 4 had a extremely disappointing start, starting, yeah, yeah, had a really disappointing start for about five years, there was, like, nothing to play on it, you know, but I don't know, we'll have to see, you know, the gaming industry is in a really 
rough position right now and I don't think this acquisition is really helping in that sense but anyway let's move on to a few trailers we're going to talk about uh, the first one is going to be for something that I've been looking forward to for a while and that is going to be the Cuphead show uh, finally they released a trailer uh, it was I guess a, a match made in heaven to some extent to take Cuphead which was a you know, literal smash hit of a game. It's I, it's pretty much iconic as of now, and kind of give it its own cartoon, given that it was based on cartoons. And this is basically my kind of show. So you can imagine I'm pretty hyped for the series. Um, I do need to beat the game though. I actually own it, but I just you know, I haven't got around to it. Um, I need to beat it before I watch it. So that's something to add to the list as well. But this series is beautifully animated. Like my gosh. Although it's incredibly faithful to like the rubber hose, like 1930s, 1940s, you know, era of animation, it's nice to see the series like mix styles. Like for example, the house is live action, it was a live action model or set, whatever you want to call it, in the background with animation on top of it. That's something that was kind of done during that era, but very rarely. Like for example, there is a Popeye animation that does that where Popeye is walking into a cave and the cave is live action, but he's animation. I don't know the particular name of it, but if you look it up, you will find that particular piece. Um, it's nice to see that Miss Chalice is going to be a recurring character in the series. Like, hopefully she gets an episode where she can really shine. Um, their voices are spot on for the error of speech they're trying to go for. I'm not even going to try and intimidate it. Um, but, yeah, it is really interesting. And I like the smaller, like, design of, like, the devil. Obviously, in the game, from what I know, he's a little bit bigger to some extent. Because I know what he's a reference to. He's a reference to a, I think, Betty Boo in Hell. But, yeah, he does still have his, like, menacing appearance, but he's more, like, expressive and has more of, like, a personality now. And, yeah, he's a slightly more comedic and villain. Uh, he's, a, he's a more comedic villain, which I think is the right route to go with with him if you're going to have him be a recurring villain and, you know, have him, you know, getting annoyed and frustrated at both, you know, Cuphead and Mugman. But it is pretty interesting. I mean... I do wonder how the series is actually going to work to some extent because is each episode just going to reference or like set up a boss in the game or is it going to provide context for like the bosses in the world like really flesh out the game like is it going to be a companion piece or is it just going to be like a a weird like nostalgia reference I hope not because you do see the boxing frogs and it does seem like we're going to spend a little bit more time with them rather than just like oh look it's the frog frogs from the game but yeah and although I can tell that, like, the film grain is artificial, I admire the commitment to really make it have that sort of aesthetic and that style. I can kind of imagine uh, children kind of being confused by it to some extent. Although then again, I think most children are a little bit more clued up on what Cuphead is a reference to, to some extent, given how popular it is. But yeah, I guess the only other question I have is, like, if Cuphead is giving a cartoon, where's the Undertale cartoon? Like... That makes a lot of sense to some extent. I, I don't know. I haven't really played Undertale or Deltarune. You know, do people agree? Would that make a good cartoon? I don't know. Let me know. <laughs> uh, next trailer we have is going to be for Moon Knight. This is, uh, I guess, the next Marvel TV series coming out in April. And I literally know nothing about this character. And I'm kind of interested in this. Although I also don't really care at the same time because I didn't think it looked that good, honestly. Um, first of all, I've got to mention, we're doing the whole, like, slowed down modern remix of, like, a popular song to make it sound epic gimmick. Um, and with Kid Cudi's, like, Day and Night? Like, really? That's, like, one of the lamest songs he's ever released. Like, granted, it was one of the first songs he released, and it's the one that pushed him into stardom, but still. Like, just because it has the line of him saying Day and Night? Really? Like, oh, come on, guys. You could think of a better, tr um, song to, like, implement and kind of you know, have themes around that, I don't know, get some Egyptian lover to do some, like, music or something like that, or walk like an Egyptian, literally, I don't know, um, the London and History Museum is a cool setting, it's very fitting for, like, once again, the ancient Egyptian theme, the idea of a superhero having, I guess, their reality blur between, like, nightmare and dream, especially if that's, like, their weakness or power is a pretty interesting angle, I don't know how accurate that is to the comics, but I can see it I can see them kind of going for a slightly more um, horror-ish or kind of like spooky or 
uh, psychological element with some of the visuals, like he's being chased or he thinks he's being chased by like a mummy, which is pretty cool. That's a neat thing. I know a lot of people are wondering if this show is going to be like 18 rated or 18 plus, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think it's going to be a soft 18, to be honest, because it's it's Disney. They want everyone to watch it or be able to watch it to some extent. They're not going to make it violent, disturbing and disgusting. That's, you know, they're not ready for that yet. Um, his costume, I think, looks pretty amazing, to be honest. But the CGI, CGI eyes cheapens it for me. I, that, that did not look good. When he turns around, you see his eyes glowing and I could see that that was an after effect. I was just like, oh God, you know, kind of ruined it to some extent, but yeah, um, it looks all right. I probably won't watch it. <laughs> um, next or final trailer we have is gonna be for the film simply titled X. Um, I'm getting a lot of uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre from 1974 vibes from this one. And yeah, just a simple classic setup, you know, just a bunch of, I guess, amateur porn act actors going to like the middle of nowhere, staying at a place and then some creepy stuff happens or disturbing, horrific. I don't really know what it is, but yeah, I really hope they run with the grindhouse exploitation style, um, which I think works in its favor to some extent. It does seem quite tongue in cheek and they're not really taking themselves that seriously, which is what I really like about this trailer. Also, A24 has picked up this film, so you know it's going to be interesting or something at least, you know, they... They very rarely they don't they don't tend to pick up just garbage or whatever they can get it. They there's a seal of quality when it comes to A twenty four, even if all their films or even if some of their films aren't to your liking to some extent. But yeah, you know, despite looking like it was shot on film or it's trying to look like it was shot on film, uh, or during that era, um maybe the porno itself, like the you know, what they're actually filming, maybe that was actually filmed on film, which would be a really nice detail, but it's despite its very old look is what I'm I guess trying to say it's a very good looking and cinematic film there's a lot of really nice like shots and uh, camera angles in there it, it really it really does feel like one of those films that's gonna I guess become more of a film as the film goes on or when the horror starts to some extent and I'm honestly really interested to see like whatever's going on it looks creepy already like you know once again going back to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre like element just the the family and there's something wrong with them yeah that's a really kind of creepy and interesting, you know, vibe, you know, Evil Dead as well comes to mind. So we'll see if it's wearing its influences on its sleeve or maybe it'll do something completely crazy, which I hope it does. But yeah, uh, that's a more underrated film I want to recommend to some extent. But yeah, uh, that's pretty much going to wrap up this podcast. It's a short one. It's a jam packed one. I kind of just wanted to get this one, you know, done and dusted for you guys because, yeah, didn't really need to dilly-dally on these things because a lot of them, although they're quite big, they're kind of small in, in, to some extent. But I guess I'm going to leave you with the video of the episode, which is going to be Denzel Curry with Walking. Um, this is the official music video for, I guess, his first song of his newest album, which I guess is going to be called Melt My Eyes or Melt Your Eyes. I can't remember the exact title, but yeah. Um, it's more of a film than anything, to be honest. Uh, fantastic music video. Fantastic song that kind of has Denzel flowing with a slight, slightly more of a... It's more jazz rap to some extent, although it kind of does delve more into more beat production towards the later half. I do love the sample and how mellow this track is, and hopefully you guys enjoy this one as well, because, yeah, absolutely love this one. Also, um, watch this video carefully. There's a lot of um, interesting details you might miss in the video itself and yeah um it is funny how denzel curry slash the director of this music video which i cannot remember his name but he deserves all the props in the world i love how they made something that's better than the boba fett show and i'm going to leave you guys on that note as i'm going to end this podcast like i always do by saying i was the angry raccoon and i will see you on the next podcast